Hello again, and welcome to Aviation News Talk, where we talk general aviation with relevant news and flying tips for pilots and student pilots to help keep you safe. I'm Max Truscott. I'm the author of several books on the Garmin G1000, 3000, 5000, and Perspective Glass Cockpits, and the 2008 National Flight Instructor of the Year. Today, I'll be talking about the new Lightspeed Delta Zulu headset announced today. I was invited to use a demo version of the headset, so I've flown with it, and I'll tell you about its new features that you won't find on other headsets, and I'll tell you what it was like flying with it. Also, since some of you were unable to hear one side of my conversation back in episode 244 with Dr. Dylan Caldwell, when he was talking about things you should do before going to your FAA flight physical, I'll replay that interview at the end of the show. Also, we have a listener question about basic med versus third class medicals that the doctor answers. Last week in episode 245, we talked about what you need to know about different traffic systems, including TIS, TAS, and ADSB. So if you didn't hear that episode, you may want to check it out at aviationnewstalk.com slash 245. And next week, we'll be talking with airshow pilot Sean D. Tucker. You're not going to want to miss that episode. And so you don't, make sure you click on either the follow or the subscribe button in whatever app that you're listening to us now so that the episode will download next week for free. And this is a listener-supported show. We're ad-free. So think about the value you get from the show. Have you ever learned something that might help save your life someday? Think about what you might pay for an hour of flight instruction or ground instruction and consider becoming a member and signing up to support the show financially at aviationnewstalk.com slash awesome. And when you do, I'll read your name on the show. This week in the news, the first fatal DA-42 accident in the U.S. occurred last week and it was unusual. A King Air was stolen and the pilot threatened to crash into a Walmart and Texas officials stop a Gulfstream 4 before it did something illegal. All this and more, and the news starts now. From WSVN.com, two planes flip over at Orlando Executive Airport, killing one person. At Orlando Executive Airport last week, two planes flipped over, which killed one person and sent someone else to the hospital. It happened Thursday afternoon when severe weather rolled in with winds up to 62 miles per hour. Video showed those fierce gusts of wind around the same time the planes flipped. The bad weather also sent debris flying, including pieces of metal and part of a shopping cart that barely missed parked cars at the shopping center nearby. The stormy weather was also blamed for the flipped planes and even damage to plane hangars. According to Orlando Executive Airport Director of GA, Judith Ann Jarrett, unfortunately that system moved in so fast and it was so severe with very heavy gusty winds that it actually flipped the airplanes. One plane was empty, but the other was taxiing on the runway for departure with two people inside. Airport officials have not identified them, and it remains unclear if the person killed was the pilot or the passenger. And an email from Patreon supporter Trevor Moody tells us that this is a DA-42 accident. He has a spreadsheet where he keeps track of DA-42 accidents, and he says this is the first fatal DA-42 accident in the U.S., which is pretty amazing because that airplane's probably been out for at least 15 years. From avweb.com, King Air down, pilot in custody after crash threat. A 29-year-old Tupelo, Mississippi man is facing a string of charges, including federal terrorism counts after a five-hour flight in a stolen King Air C-90. Authorities allege that Corey Patterson, who has some flying experience, took the fully fueled King Air, owned by Southeast Aviation, from the ramp of his employer, Tupelo Aviation Services, about 5 a.m. He reportedly called 911 on a cell phone and threatened to crash the plane into a Tupelo Walmart. After crisscrossing northern Mississippi for more than five hours, the plane ended up in a soybean field near Ripley, about 40 miles north of Tupelo. Tupelo police said in a news conference the pilot was a ramp attendant at Tupelo Aviation. At one point, police negotiators and a local pilot talked the man into landing at the airport, but he aborted the landing at the last minute and headed north and out of contact with authorities. From KnoxNews.com, Cirrus Aircraft employee dies in Texas crash after plane took off from Knoxville. Cirrus Aircraft employee died Thursday night in a plane crash near Spring, Texas, a company spokesperson confirmed. Two other people were on board and were transported to a local hospital. The Cirrus SR-22 took off from McGee Tyson Airport in Knoxville with three people and crashed on the way to David Wayne Hooks Memorial Airport at around 5 p.m. local time, according to the FAA. An official from the NTSB confirmed the plane crashed on its approach to the airport and said it was sending in an investigator. According to the spokesperson, a preliminary report will be completed in about three weeks. Now, I've looked at the FlightAware data, and it shows that it was a fairly normal approach all the way down to just two or 300 feet above the ground. 
And at that altitude, you're too low to pull the parachute if something goes wrong, and it doesn't appear the parachute was pulled. Dr. Scott Denstedt wrote on the CirrusPilots.org forum that at the time of the accident, there was a pretty significant outflow boundary moving to the south-southwest and another collapsing cell over the approach corridor to the airport. The interaction between the two might have created some nasty turbulence and shear on final. Somebody also commented that it's unlikely that they would be able to see the outflow boundary with any onboard equipment. And Dr. Densett replied that's correct, given that these outflow boundaries are non-precipitation returns that are promptly filtered out by data link weather. He said to think about pouring pancake batter on a griddle, it hits the ground and then spreads out equally in all directions. Once it strikes the ground and moves away, the depth of the outflow boundary is usually contained to within about 8,000 feet AGL. So it's a very, very deep boundary within the air. From Newser.com, man dies while scattering his father's ashes. Leo John Semensky died August 7th in 50 Lakes, Minnesota at age 80. His son died three weeks later, apparently during the process of scattering his dad's ashes. KLAS reports Lee Semensky, 58, was in an ultralight airplane piloted by Douglas A. Johnson that went down in a wooded area near Emily, Minnesota. A press release from the Crow Wing County Sheriff's Office states that the wreckage was found at 8.36 p.m., roughly two hours after the authorities were informed the aircraft hadn't arrived at its intended destination. Per the FAA, the men were in a single-engine Crucker Signet Ultralight Trike. People report that Johnson ran a business called Fly the Swan, whose website explains that its special light sport aircraft enables a bird's-eye view of the lake and the land you love, along with the exhilaration of taking off from and gently touching down on the water. Now, I do want to mention in the past that I've read about multiple incidents where pilots have had difficulty trying to spread ashes from an airplane. And based on the difficulty of doing that without having the ashes spread inside the aircraft, I would never try it. From news.sky.com, Citation Jet crashes off the coast of Latvia after NATO jets are scrambled. A private plane has crashed off the Latvian coast after fighter jets from across Europe were scrambled to follow its journey. The Cessna Citation 551 set off from southern Spain at 1.56 UK time. German news site Bild said that it was supposed to land at the Cologne Bonn airport, but reported pressure problems in the cabin shortly after takeoff. French and Spanish fighter jets were sent up, but couldn't see anyone in the cockpit or cabin. A family of three and a pilot were reportedly on board. Flight trackers showed headed northeast at Paris toward Cologne, but the aircraft went past the city and out over the Baltic Sea. German and Danish warplanes also shadowed it as it passed through their airspace, but were unable to make contact. From Spokesman.com, pilots in 2020 fatal midair crash above Lake Coeur d'Alene didn't see each other. The pilots of two planes that collided over Lake Coeur d'Alene at about 2 p.m. on July 5, 2020, didn't see each other, causing the crash that left eight people dead, according to the final report released last week. Reading from the NTSB report, the float-equipped de Havilland DHC-2 was on a tour flight, and the Cessna 206 was on a personal flight. The airplanes collided in midair over a lake during day VMC. No radar or ADSB data were available for either aircraft, which, by the way, doesn't mean that the aircraft weren't equipped with ADSB. It just means that they were flying too low to be detected by any ADSB receiver on the ground. Continuing, witnesses reported that the airplanes were flying directly toward each other before they collided about seven to 800 feet above the water. Other witnesses reported that the Cessna was at a lower altitude and had initiated a climb before the collision. Review of two seconds of video captured as part of a witness's live photo showed that both airplanes appeared to be in level flight before the collision. The available evidence was consistent with both pilots' failure to see and avoid the other airplane. Recovered wreckage indicated the upper fuselage of the Cessna collided with the floats and lower fuselage of the de Havilland. Probable cause? The failure of the pilots of both airplanes to see and avoid the other airplane. And I looked at the NTSB report and at a photo that a witness captured from the ground, and it did show the aircraft perhaps about a tenth of a mile apart, flying directly at each other at about the same altitude. From seattletimes.com, global air travel last year, 22 million jet flights and just one fatal flight. How safe is air travel? Last year, when large commercial jets took off 21.6 million times throughout the world, there was just one fatal accident. Boeing's comprehensive annual compilation of data about air accidents involving large Western-built jet airliners, released last week, shows a decades-long trend towards safer air travel. At the beginning of the jet age, in 1959, there were 40 fatal accidents per million flights. The accident rate fell rapidly, and a decade ago it was down to less than one fatal accident per million flights. Last year it was less than 0.05 fatal accidents per million flights. 
American Airlines operated by North American Airlines, last year the fatal accident rate was zero. Airline crashes, common as recently as the 1960s, have been increasingly rare since the late 1990s. Measured by fatalities per total number of people carried, air travel is the safest form of mass transportation. Boeing's data does not include accidents involving small private planes, small seaplanes, business jets, or turboprops. Commercial jets manufactured in Russia and China are also excluded due to lack of operational data. From KOB.com, gliders flock to New Mexico for national championship. The 2022 Club Class National Sailplane Championships finished up over the last few days at Moriarty Airport. The 10-day competition hosts some of the best glider pilots from around the world. Every day, pilots compete by flying a different course or task in the sky. This is the first time the competition is held in New Mexico. Sylvia Grandstaff, a competitive glider pilot, said, The highest I've ever been was actually here in New Mexico. It was a few years ago, and the mountains were set up with really neat weather phenomena called Mountain Wave, where we can get really smooth flights to high altitudes, and I was up past 25,000 feet. With unique weather conditions like these, pilots from all over traveled to New Mexico for the opportunity to fly in these special southwestern skies. The courses the pilots fly change daily and can range from 100 to 300 miles. Many of these pilots were introduced to gliding by their parents or grandparents when they were as little as 13. The gliding community gravitates toward the older generation right now. There's been a massive shortage of pilots across the competitive air sport right now. For veteran soarers, attracting the new generation of the sport is very important. And separately, I just read that the Women's World Gliding Championship 2022, which was held in the UK, just wound up 14 intense competition days and thousands of kilometers of flying. So congratulations to everyone involved, including Team Germany, which won the women's team competition. From GeneralAviationNews.com, passenger retracts flaps during go-around. The pilot reported that during landing at the airport in Bridgeport, California, which is up by Mono Lake in the Sierras, he elected to go around because of an overshoot of final and an unstable approach. He applied full power, raised the landing gear, and initiated a climb out. At the same time, the pilot-rated passenger inadvertently raised the flaps prematurely, which caused the Cessna 210 to settle onto the runway with the landing gear retracted. Once the propeller struck the runway, the airplane veered off to the right of the runway and sustained substantial damage to the fuselage. The pilot reported that there were no pre-accident mechanical failures or malfunctions with the airplane that would have precluded normal operation. Probable cause, an inadvertent retraction of the flaps during a go-around, by the pilot-rated passenger, which caused the airplane to settle onto the runway with the landing gear retracted. And I think the key takeaway from this is that we should always brief our passengers about what they're allowed to do to assist us in the cockpit. From SanJoseSpotlight.com, Santa Clara County to study lead levels near the airport again. Santa Clara County is planning another study of airborne lead levels around Reed Hillview Airport after banning the sale of leaded fuel at the facility a year ago. Deputy County Executive David Campos told a group of East San Jose residents about the new study at a community meeting last week. This is the third study on lead levels around the airport since 2021. He said the new study will help officials determine the current level of danger from airborne lead and the impact of the ban of leaded fuel. There is an intention to analyze the level of lead in the air after the action of not selling leaded fuel, Campos said. Noted officials haven't decided on a scope or timeline for the study. Santa Clara County Board voted unanimously last August to nix the sale of leaded fuel at county-owned airports, the first in the nation to do so. Pilots can still fuel their planes with leaded fuel elsewhere and land in Reed Hillview. The decision to ban the sale of leaded airplane fuel came after a county commission study found elevated lead levels in the blood of children living around the East San Jose Airport. The percentage of children with high lead levels in the study is consistent with the state average San Jose Spotlight previously reported, But the CDC says there's no safe level of lead in the body. The county commissioned a second study last year examining lead levels in the soil around the airport. And my recollection is that in one of the prior studies, airborne samples were taken and weren't found to contain any lead, even though the consultants who wrote the study indicated that lead in the surrounding community was most likely from airborne lead emitted by aircraft. From GeneralAviationNews.com, Maine grass airstrip survives solar farm threat. The Charles A. Chase Memorial Field in Dover, Foxcroft, Maine, was almost lost to the GA flying community and replaced with a solar farm. In 2019, the town fathers wanted to replace the rural airfield with a solar farm. Since the airport had never received federal grants, local officials thought this would be an easy task. They didn't take the local GA community into account. What happened in this little town is a blueprint for how to save a GA airport. 
More than 60 years ago, Charles A. Chase Jr. was killed in a plane crash at the family on Grass Field. Since then, the Chase family considered it a memorial to Charles. As time went on, the family donated the airport to the town of Dover Foxcroft with the understanding that it would remain an airport in perpetuity. When Charles' grandchildren got wind of the town's plans for deactivating the airport, they were upset. Many of the local citizens supported them in convincing the town fathers to reverse their decision. At a hearing on the proposal in November 2019, more than 100 GA pilots and aviation enthusiasts turned out to plead the case for not shutting down the airport. Additionally, several main flying clubs organized a fly-in to show support for the airport prior to the hearing. All these folks were not opposed to solar energy, but felt the town could still have this airport and find another spot for the solar farm. As a result of all this grassroots support, the town decided to find a different location for the solar farm, resulting in a win-win situation. From FlyingMag.com, Aviation Community Rallies to Save Florida Airport from Closure, an adjacent airpark could be left with no airport. That's the situation facing residents of Tarpine Air Park, just south of Panacea, Florida. The airpark is adjacent to Wakala County Airport. On September 19th, the Wakala County Board of County Commissioners is expected to vote to close the county-owned public-use airport. Since 1987, the air park has had a through-the-fence agreement with Wakala County for airport access. There are 47 homes at the air park. It's the only public-use airport in Wakala County, said Stephen Fultz, who's been the airport manager for 10 years. If the Wakala County commissioners vote to close the airport, the airport license that allows it to operate will be revoked, and the 15 acres that the airport sits on will be declared surplus property. Wakala County Airport was established in the 1960s by Fenton Jones, a local lodge owner. Jones donated the property to the county in 1966 under the condition that the property would always remain a public airport. The airport has a grass runway aligned north-south and has 20 tea hangers on the property. Supporters of the airport are urging concerned citizens to reach out to the Wakala County Board of County Commissioners to voice their opposition to the closure. And finally, from foxnews.com, Texas officials stop airplane human smuggling attempt. One migrant allegedly paid $11,000. The Texas Department of Public Safety stopped a human smuggling attempt that was set to be carried out by using an airplane at the South Texas International Airport in Edinburgh, Texas last week. A DPS pilot had become suspicious when he noticed a group of 15 people dropped off at the main gate. He then conducted a ramp check on a Gulfstream 4 aircraft because he suspected the aircraft was being used in human smuggling. The DPS pilot then contacted the person who chartered the plane, Maximo Diaz Jorge, who said the group of people were his employees at an oil company traveling to Houston to see a baseball game. However, after the DPS official asked for identification from the individuals, all of them ran away. While the individuals tried to flee the area, the DPS pilot was hit by an SUV that was driven by Andrina Felix, who was among the group of people. In total, eight males and five females were among the illegal immigrants from the Dominican Republic in El Salvador and referred to the U.S. Border Patrol. According to a DPS official, one of the migrants claimed to have paid $11,000 in total to be smuggled, which included $7,000 to be smuggled into the U.S., as well as another $4,000 to be smuggled by an airplane. Felix 29, who is from the DR, was arrested for aggravated assault on a public servant and smuggling of persons. Diaz Jorge, 40, was taken to a local hospital after he experienced a medical emergency. Well, that's the news for this week. Coming up next, I'll tell you about my experiences using the new Lightspeed Delta Zulu headset. And finally, we'll hear from AME Dylan Caldwell about what to do to prepare for your next medical. And we'll hear a listener question about basic med versus a third-class medical. All right here on the Aviation News Talk podcast. And now let's talk about headsets and hearing loss. In the five and a half years I've produced Aviation News Talk, we've never talked about headsets. And if you're not interested, you can just skip ahead 13 minutes to our next segment, which starts at the 32-minute mark. But at the end of this segment, I'll tell you why I've been using Lightspeed headsets for almost 25 years. Also, if you'd like to support the show and you're ever thinking about buying a Lightspeed headset, please start by clicking on the link in our show notes, which you'll find at aviationnewstalk.com slash 246 as you will pay the same as you would ordering a headset anywhere else, except Lightspeed will pay a nice referral fee to help support Aviation News Talk, if and only if you start with our link to their website. Now, you may recall that last year in episode 187, 
We talked about what you need to know about hearing loss, how hearing loss affects people, and the many ways that pilots and others can permanently damage their hearing. Now there's a new headset that not only helps prevent more hearing loss, but it also provides pilots with a custom sound profile to compensate for hearing loss that we already have. But probably the best feature of the headset is it has a built-in carbon monoxide monitor that's always on when the headset is on. And I love that because now I don't have to remember to pull out and turn on my standalone CO monitor when I fly. The headset is the new Lightspeed Delta Zulu, which was just announced a day ago. I've already flown with a headset and I'll share with you what I've learned. Now, how did I get so lucky? Lightspeed contacted me a couple of weeks ago and offered to lend me a demo unit and I accepted. First, ANR or automatic noise reduction headsets were introduced about 25 years ago. So the technology is mature. There's just not a lot of improvement to be had in making headsets quieter. The Lightspeed says the noise reduction is a little better in the Delta Zulu than their prior headsets. So since there's not a lot of improvement to be gained in making headsets quieter, Lightspeed chose to add new functions to bring additional value to headset users. And I think they've made some good choices. Let's talk about the CO monitor. If you haven't heard episode 90, in which I interviewed Mooney pilot Dan Bass, who passed out on his third flight of the day due to an exhaust system leak that let CO into his cockpit, you've got to listen to that episode, and you'll find it at aviationnewstalk.com 90. On his third flight of the day, Dan passed out during the climb with the autopilot on, and when his aircraft eventually ran out of gas, it descended at climb speed and crashed into a snowy field in Minnesota, where Dan woke up in the crashed airplane. Here are a couple comments from episode 88 in which I talked about carbon monoxide poisoning. Although you can't see, smell, or taste it, carbon monoxide can make you sick or kill you. The problem is severe enough that the FAA tasked Wichita State University to investigate the problem and solutions. According to the report, the FAA standard for CO in an aircraft cabin is no more than 50 parts per million. However, there's currently no requirement to monitor for CO in the cabin. Wichita State found that CO was detected on more than 90% of the flights monitored, either on the ground, in the air, or both, but the majority of CO events detected were less than 10 ppm, with a very small percentage of flights detected with levels above 50 ppm. Now, many pilots use a cardboard chemical patch detector that sticks to the instrument panel. These are inexpensive, less than $10, but have drawbacks. First, they don't detect low levels of carbon monoxide. Test shows that they take a couple of minutes of exposure to high levels of carbon monoxide in excess of 100 ppm before they change color. They also need to be replaced every few months, so unless a pilot is diligent about changing them, he or she may get a false sense of security. One thing I learned while producing episodes 88 and 90 was that a single backfire, such as when you're starting the engine, can damage an aircraft's exhaust system sufficiently to let carbon monoxide into your cabin. So even if your plane is well-maintained and you've checked it for CO in the past, you're only one backfire away from getting CO poisoning. The new Lightspeed Delta Zulu headset, which I've been trying out, has a built-in CO monitor, and it gives you a voice alarm through the headset if it measures CO above certain thresholds. And Lightspeed has a new app for the headset, and in that app you can set the sensitivity for two alerting levels. The default threshold for the caution alert is 50 ppm, and for the warning alert, it's 100 ppm. Now, those levels are higher than I would prefer, but in the app, I can set the caution threshold with a slider to any value between 10 and 50 ppm, and the warning threshold to anything between 51 and 100 ppm. The caution alert message is repeated every five minutes, and you can also set how frequently you'd like to get that message from anywhere between five and 15 minutes. Typically on past flights using my handheld CO monitor, I sometimes find when an aircraft is first started, I'll see readings of around 10 ppm, but normally in flight, it drops to a single digit level. Now, Lightspeed has had a few dozen of these headsets out in the field during the last few months being tested by pilots, so there haven't been a lot of flights with a headset. Even so, one of the testers reported a couple weeks ago that he discovered a CO leak in the plane he was flying because he was wearing the Delta Zulu headset at the time. When I flew with a headset earlier today, shortly after we started the engine, the headset said to me 5 ppm, or 5 parts per million, Later, it said 6 ppm. When we got in the air, I checked the app and it showed we were at 0 ppm and I didn't get any other voice messages from the headset about the CO levels. By the way, the app does have a stats button, which takes you to a graph to view statistics, not just for your current flight, 
but for prior flights as well, showing the CO levels. It also shows the cabin temperature, which I noted today was in the mid 80s, even with the air conditioning on in the aircraft, because outside temperatures were well over 100 degrees since we're having a heat wave here in Northern California. Having a headset with a built-in CO monitor would in itself be sufficient to make me interested in buying the Delta Zulu, but it also has a built-in equalizer that Lightspeed calls Hearing Acuity, EQ of course for equalization, that lets you customize what you hear from the headset to match any hearing loss you might have. Now the way you calibrate the headset's equalizer is similar to the way an audiologist might give you a hearing test or would customize the frequency response for a hearing aid that you might wear. Essentially, you go into a quiet room, put the headset on, turn it on, and then the app walks you through the test procedure. I did the setup in my bedroom since it's quiet, and it probably took me seven to eight minutes, but I was taking a lot of time to do it carefully, and you certainly could do it in less time. To set up the equalizer, turn on the headset and pair your iPhone with the app. Then touch the equalizer tab at the bottom, and then touch the setup button. The app will then present 125 hertz tone to one ear, and you'll need to adjust the volume slider on the app until you can just barely hear the tone. You then repeat that for 11 other tones, with the final one being at 12 kilohertz. That was the only tone I couldn't hear since it was such a high frequency, so I left the slider at the maximum volume. The app then runs through all 12 tones for your other ear. When the setup was completed, the app presented a bar graph showing the amount of gain the Delta Zulu headset will add for each frequency band to attempt to give me normal hearing. My bar graph showed some hearing loss at low and high frequencies, with the mid-range tones being more normal. When you're done, the app plays a song you can listen to and lets you switch the hearing acuity equalizer on and off so you can hear the difference it makes. As I switched it on and off, I noticed the song did sound richer with hearing acuity turned on. And by the way, if you happen to wear a hearing aid and you like to wear it under your headset when you fly, you can do that. When you set up hearing acuity, just make sure that you're wearing your hearing aid when you do the setup. During my airplane flights, I wanted to hear the difference with hearing acuity on and off, and there's a button on the headset control box you can double push to turn it on and off. What I found when listening to controllers was their voices sounded richer and less tinny, so it actually made listening to the radio a little less irritating. And I say that because listening to the radio gets a little tiring to me after being in the airplane for hours, and anything that makes that more pleasant is a welcome change. Batteries are often an issue with ANR headsets, but the Delta Zulu has a really slick solution that lets you swap batteries faster than any other headset I've seen. The control box, which is in line with the headset cord, has a rechargeable lithium ion battery that snaps in and out in just a second. Lightspeed says the battery lasts about 30 hours when it's fully charged. Plus, you can charge the battery in flight with a USB-A cable that Lightspeed provides. Just plug the cable that comes with the headset into a USB port in your aircraft or any portable battery pack. Lightspeed also provides a second battery pack that holds AA batteries. So that is a great backup if the rechargeable battery fails and you don't have a USB port for recharging the battery. In the plane, after turning the headset on and connecting to the Lightspeed app on my iPhone, I heard through the headset, battery charge full, which was a comforting message as I hate running out of battery power when using an ANR headset. The headset also includes Bluetooth that enables cell phone connections and streaming of music from your phone or tablet in flight. You can also buy separate cables for connecting to 3.5 millimeter and lightning port devices like an iPhone if you like the additional reliability that a cable provides versus Bluetooth connections. I've used a cable like that for years with my Zulu 3 headset so that I can stream Facebook Live videos when I'm at lower altitudes where I can get cellular data in the phone. The benefit of the cable is that I can narrate the video in real time and respond to people who are watching the video live. I'll include a link in the show notes to my two most recent Facebook Live videos that I shot while flying about 1,200 feet above the Monterey Bay. You can also record everything you hear in the cockpit directly to the Lightspeed app. It will record what you hear on the comm radios and everything you say and hear over the intercom. I've used this many times in the past to record conversations, which I can then share with students I'm flying with. The Delta Zulu also has an auto shutoff, which saves batteries by turning your headset off after it hasn't been used for about a minute. I know it works as the headset turned off a few times as I was playing with it on my desk to learn its features. It can be ordered with any of the following connectors. The dual GA plugs, which are the most common headset connector in GA aircraft. 
the Limo connector, which is a single round black connector found in some newer aircraft, or the U-174 helicopter connector. And the headset also has a seven-year warranty. Now let me tell you briefly why I've been using Lightspeed headsets for almost 25 years and currently own three different models that I've acquired over the years. Headsets are a very personal choice because not everyone's ears are the same, so what feels good to you may not feel good to someone else. I initially started using Lightspeed headsets because they didn't hurt my ears, unlike a competitive model, which made my ears hurt a lot after wearing the headset for just an hour. That particular headset model has long since been replaced by a more comfortable model. Still, I'm sold on Lightspeed for several reasons. I love their trade-up program, which helps me preserve the investment in my headset. Years ago, I started with Lightspeed 15, traded up to the 20, and later the 25, and then to the Zulu, and then the Zulu 3. And getting hundreds of dollars back when you trade in your old headset feels really good. I've also had my Lightspeed serviced a few times, and they've always gotten the headsets back to me quickly for no charge. And for years, I've been able to record everything I hear in my headset, including the radios and the intercom using the Lightspeed app on my iPhone. And since I started Aviation News Talk over five years ago, I've always had links to Lightspeed headsets in the show notes, though I almost never mention it on the show. But I'm mentioning it now because I know that someday you'll buy another headset, because pilots always need more headsets. And when you decide to check out Lightspeed headsets, I want you to go to the website by clicking on one of the links in our show notes which you can find by swiping in the podcast app you're listening to, or which you can find at aviationnewstalk.com slash 246. And when you use that link to get to the Lightspeed headsets, if you end up buying a headset, Lightspeed will pay a nice referral fee to support the show. And I'm sure you're curious, what do they cost? Well, the Delta Zulu headset sells for $1099. The Zulu 3 that I've been using for the last few years currently sells for $850, and the Sierra sells for $650. Coming up next, a few of my updates, and then a listener question about Basic Med, and then our interview with Dr. Dylan Caldwell, all right here on the Aviation News Talk podcast. And yeah, let's get to the good news. This comes from PayPal donor Robert Shapiro. He says, Pass my commercial gyroplane check ride at Ron's Gyros in Searcy, Arkansas. That's great. Congratulations. And he sent a pretty neat photo of himself with a gyrocopter. I'm going to go ahead and post that on our Patreon site and make it available to everybody. If you've never been to our Patreon site, head on out to aviationnewstalk.com slash awesome, and you'll see Robert standing next to the gyroplane. And congratulations to Patreon supporter Richard Kramer. He passed his CFI check right. He says, Hi, Max. I really enjoy your podcast. They're a valuable asset to the flying community. I fly out of KGPI, that's Glacier Park International Airport up in Montana, with an Aerostar and a 172. I'm 66 years old and last week passed my CFI check ride. It was some hard work, especially since I hadn't done commercial maneuvers in 35 years. I had to relearn everything. Thanks again for all you do. Hey, Richard, congratulations to you. Now let's go to a listener question. Hi, Max. This is Deb Gangwish, and I have a question regarding last week's podcast with Dr. Dylan Caldwell. My question is, what are his thoughts, or uh, does he have many people that concurrently hold an FAA medical certificate, whether it's third, second, or first, as well as hold their basic med I've had some discussions with people who have said to, it might be a good idea to hold both. And I was just wondering your thoughts. My AME personally told me that um, there's no need for that. So just a question and wondering if you could answer that for me or talk to Dr. Caldwell and see what his thoughts are. Appreciate the podcast as always. Thanks so much. And here's what Dr. Dylan Caldwell had to say. For almost every pilot, there's no reason to have both the same time. The easiest way to think about the difference of the two is that standard medical certificates have no inherent flight restrictions written into their regulations, but they do carry with them greater regulations regarding medical problems. Conversely, basic med has inherent restrictions on the type of flying you can do, such as altitude, gross weight, speed, etc. However, there are much fewer medical restrictions written into basic med. There's 16 specific things that require a special issuance, and then you could continue flying under basic med. The only time where a pilot might have both is that if a standard medical certificate is currently being deferred, 
It hasn't been revoked, denied, or suspended, but it's simply in deferred. It is still legal for that person to fly under basic med pending final decision by the FAA about his standard medical certificate. If that medical certificate is granted, then he can, without any problems, then he can go back to flying under a standard medical certificate. However, his med- if his standard medical certificate has been revoked, denied, or suspended, then he can no longer fly in basic, basic med. I hope that helps answer the question. Thanks again for having me on your show. Great. Thanks so much for that. Now, here's an article I ran across that was posted by the FAA, Going to the Birds to Prevent Hazardous Strikes. It says that promising research suggests that UV lights mounted on helicopters and planes drive birds away from aircraft in danger. The FAA is researching new and potentially game-changing technology that significantly reduces the chances of birds striking GA aircraft. The technology inverts the customary approach to bird hazards, namely how pilots can avoid or maneuver around birds. The new approach, if positive results from research continue to play out, gives birds the warnings they need to fly out of the paths of oncoming airplanes and helicopters. And it says when the FAA began research on bird strike avoidance in 2015, it considered two questions. One, can we put a radar system in the cockpit to help pilots avoid birds? And or two, can we identify a system that deters birds from coming near us? And it says that birds have tetrachromatic color sensitivity, which means they see red, green, blue, and ultraviolet colors. Research at the FAA's William Hughes Technical Center experimented with replacing the landing lights found on most GA aircraft with a pulsating ultraviolet LED light that birds can detect. And they tested the UV lights on Rodney Shelley's air tractor 802. Shelley is the owner and pilot for his crop dusting company in Fisher, Arkansas. He flew the plane for roughly 80 hours over the course of several weeks. The FAA had him running through various scenarios, such as takeoffs and landings with the UV lights on and off, diving and hard banking. With the lights on, I could circle the field. The ducks would take off and leave me alone, Shelley described. They wouldn't stay in the field with me like they normally do. They would turn and go the opposite way immediately. It was pretty interesting. He also noticed that when the UV lights were turned off, the birds returned quickly. He estimates the birds were spotting the plane with the UV LED lights on from as far as 166 yards away compared to 108 yards away without the lights on, giving the fowl plenty of time to maneuver out of harm's way. So interesting story. Who knows in the future we may be replacing our landing lights with UV lights. And the UK's CAA agency, which is similar to the FAA in the United States, has a new Safety Sense brochure available for GA pilots that covers all aspects of ditching an aircraft into water. I'm not going to go into that, but I will include a link in the show notes, so feel free to go to the show notes to access that brochure. And here's an email from Patreon supporter Stephen Siska. He says, Hi Max, I came across this video on YouTube and thought it would be of interest to you if you haven't seen it. It's one of the best real-life point-of-view VFR and IMC videos I've seen. The pilot is instrument rated and on an instrument flight plan, yet it shows how quickly things can get very stressful. What struck me the most was how quickly he appeared to stop flying straight and level. I'm not criticizing, but interesting to see how compounding circumstances can make a relatively simple issue to deal with dangerous. I recently purchased your G1000 book and look forward to each of your shows each week. Thanks so much for your, all your interesting and informative content. You can count on me as a supporter for long into the future. Thank you very much, Stephen. And I'm going to include a link to that video in our show notes. To find the show notes, just swipe in whatever podcast app that you're listening to us on or go out to aviationnewstalk.com slash 246. And here's an email from Patreon supporter John Weisswasser. He said, first, the listener question about the absence of the advisory vertical guidance on some non-precision GPS approaches in the G1000 is a real phenomenon. At my airport, Caldwell, New Jersey, we have an LP approach to runway four. The plate lists a VDA, that would be the vertical descent angle, of zero degrees or absent because the last segment of the approach, the visual descent from MDA to the threshold crossing height, was not clear of obstacles in the 34 to 1 standard, I believe. As a result, my G1000 would not provide plus V for this approach. I made a lot of noise with Piper and Garmin, and I learned that if the VDA is listed at zero under certain circumstances, the G1000 will not provide an advisory glide slope. The fix for this is found in later versions of the G1000 software that uses a terrain database resolution of 4.9 arc seconds instead of the older 9 arc seconds. For me, that meant upgrading to the G1000 NXI in my Meridian. Interestingly, there's a site that everyone who uses a Garmin platform should be aware of that lists anomalous or absent approaches from the database, which can be found here. 
and he gives a link at the Garmin website, which I will include in the show notes. He says, second, as to your observation that pilots flying in APR mode on a non-precision approach with advisory vertical guidance will often forget to arrest the descent and bust the MDA, one trick I use is to get established and configured as far out on the advisory path as possible. Then, when crossing the final approach fix, or shortly thereafter, while tracking the plus V or advisory glide slope and stable, I change the mode to a VS, that would be the vertical speed mode on the autopilot, with the MDA dialed into the altitude preselect window. I then adjust my track along the plus V by minor changes to the vertical speed. That way, I'm stable and never bust the MDA. Hope this helps. Yes, that's a really great suggestion, and I've talked about this in the past. What John is referring to is that if you're using the approach mode on most autopilots and you're flying the plus V, the advisory glide slope, on a non-precision approach with an MDA, the autopilot will go right through that MDA. So John has a solution here that will allow it to level off. So thanks so much for sending that. From patron supporter David Dow, he says, I'm an organizer of the Memphis IMC Club at memimc.club. We meet once a month via Zoom. I'm working on the next meeting, and I'm thinking about an IFR scenario where we discuss the entire flight start to finish in terms of things the pilots need to do, plus potential gotchas. Have you ever seen a pre-trip checklist? These are the types of things pilots need to do one to four days before a flight. Might start with the PAVE checklist and the I'm Safe acronym. Then continue with the big picture on weather, route, departure procedures, alternates beyond what's required for the FAA, aircraft squawks, inspections, plan B if the flight can't be completed, identification of potential threats and mitigation strategies, etc. Seems like a checklist of some sort would simplify the process, result in consistency, and ensure nothing gets skipped. Any input you can offer will be appreciated. And I sent an email back to David and said, I don't know that I've seen a trip checklist like this, though it's similar to what I do for long ferry trips, bringing an airplane back across the country. Typically, my plan is a couple of days out, so one to two days, and has a lot of emphasis on packing and logistics, and a little bit less so on weather and IFR preparations. I do start looking about five days ahead of time at the GFS charts to get a feel for whether I'll fly the southern route across New Mexico and Arizona, or the northern route across Wyoming, Utah, and Nevada. And about 75% of the time, the weather favors the southern route. And I sent him a link that I use for finding GFS forecast. I'll include that in our show notes. And I said, I hope that helps. And thanks for mentioning Aviation News Talk and my books during your meetings. So that's the Memphis IMC Club. And here's an email from patron supporter Arjun Gururaj. He says, totally agree with your evaluation of the North Las Vegas accident in my home airport. As a busy cardiologist, when I'm operating, there is a term known as a never incident. These are scenarios that honestly never should occur. For example, operating on the wrong side or limb, wrong organ, wrong patient, etc. For me as a conscientious pilot, I believe lining up on the wrong runway is a never incident. With all the fancy avionics nowadays, load up a visual approach or anything that gives you better situational awareness. If I were a CFI or CFII, no way my student would keep flying after lining up the wrong runway. As a surgeon, one never incident strike, and it will be difficult to get back at the game. 30 right and 30 left have no charted approaches, but I always load in the visual on my Garmin G1000 to get that extended center line and advisory glide slope. I hate to speculate, but I suspect the Piper pilot completely lost situational awareness and purposely lined up with 30 right. Maybe the low bank angle was to do exactly this. Also, Given the staggered runway threshold, the Piper's altitude hitting the Cessna was in line with landing on 30 right, he would have been too low for 30 left. Either way, the outcome sucked. Easy to get complacent at your home airport. We've all taken shortcuts to get home in a hurry. Not so lucky sometimes. Great show as usual. Thank you. Thanks so much for your email, Arjun. And yeah, I hadn't thought about the staggered runways. Uh, the pilot would have been much lower if they had been planning to land at uh, 30 left. And here's an email from patron supporter Martin Goodman talking about that same accident. He says, Hi, Max. I think you missed a contributing factor to the North Las Vegas crash. The wife, who was the co-pilot, was on the radios, but he was PIC. I know when my instructor takes radios when I'm under the hood, I get a little disoriented and don't always pay as close attention to ATC. Unfortunately, I'm very good friends with the pilot's son, and he told me that she often took the radios while he flew. And he said later regarding the runway, yes, I have a feeling he thought right and she was saying left. I no longer let the CFII take radios during recurrent training because for some reason I just don't pay as close attention to what's being said. 
Good point, Martin. Thanks so much for sending that. And here's an email from Patreon supporter Alan Markham. He says, regarding a departure alternate discussed in episode 241, our nav approaches can be problematic when compared to terrestrial approaches such as ILS and VORs. You must join an RNAV approach sufficiently early on the approach that the navigator will sequence correctly. With a terrestrial approach, you can join anywhere on the approach. That's a really good point, Alan. Uh, for sure, you can't join inside the final approach fix, and I'm not sure how far out you have to be to, uh, to get the glide slope guidance. He says, taking a departure off of Palo Alto, California, I use the San Jose ILS-12 and the Oakland ILS-30 as my departure alternates. I don't load these approaches into my navigator. Instead, I'll just load the ILS frequencies into the nav portions of, in my case, the GNS-480 and the GNC-255. In case of an emergency, I can be immediately set up for an approach. He says, we have a glide slope on the number two nav indicator driven by the GNC-255 and the GNS-480 driving the number one HSI, a Garmin GI-275. He says, you got me thinking though, Max, I can load the San Jose ILS-12 frequency into my number two navs active, dial the CDI, and be completely ready for that approach with no button pushing at all. I can put the same into the number one's active nav and be able to fly off the HSI with a tap or two on the GI-275. I can then put the Moffett Field Localizer 1-4 frequency into the number two nav standby and the Oakland ILS-30 frequency into the number one nav standby, or use the Hayward Localizer 2-8 left. The key things, though, are to plan the departure alternate, prepare for the emergency, and think through all of this in the comfort of my desk chair. As always, Max, thanks for an informative podcast and for your dedication to aviation safety. And here's an email from new mega supporter Carson Stilson, whose name I mentioned last week. He says, hey, Max, thank you for providing hours of instruction at literally no cost to me. I decided it was time to pay you back for how much safer your podcast has made me as a pilot. Your private pilot checkride episode with Jason Blair was on repeat for a solid two weeks before my practical exam in September of 2020, and I passed on the first try thanks to your help. Just so you know, I recently created an aviation wearables brand called Wearworthy. That's W-A-I-R-W-O-R-T-H-Y. We just launched a high-end flight bag for pilot essentials, including a headset, tablet, glasses or foggles, backup batteries, snacks, flashlight, water bottle, ID Medical, and more. I'm proud to now be a supporter of your show and can't wait to see what the future of Aviation News Talk brings. Thanks so much, Carson. And of course, aviation is a small community, so let's see if you know any of these new supporters who've just signed up in the past week to support the show. They include Eric Greenfield, edit his pledge up to $35 a month so he gets access to my online courses. We have three new people at the $20 a month level who get to see the videos I post. They include Richard L. Kramer, Peter Baker, and Bravo Whiskey, who edited his pledge up to $20 a month. We also have a number of supporters at the $8 a month level, including John Waters, Thorvon Sheffer, Ed Shapiro, and Paul Walczak. We've also got some new one-time donors. They include Eric Greenfield, who donated $100. Thank you very much. Phil Lieber, who donated $20. And Robert Shapiro, who donated $100. If you'd like to sign up to join the club and support the show, it's easy. Just head on out to aviationnewstalk.com slash awesome, where you can join Patreon and find all the goodies you get at the different dollar levels. Or if you want to make a one-time contribution, just go to aviationnewstalk.com slash PayPal. And now here's our replay from episode 244 of Dr. Dylan Caldwell talking about how to prep for your next flight physical. Dylan, welcome to the show. Great to have you here. Thank you very much. Glad to be here. Well, you had offered to talk about some do's and don'ts about flight physicals, which I thought made perfect sense. Let's start with blood pressure. That's certainly something that I'm always concerned about when I go, and I'm sure other pilots do as well. What are some of the do's and don'ts for people who have blood pressure concerns? Well, the the big thing is that no one likes going to a doctor and especially pilots don't like going to an AME because it's just, they're always scared that something's going to bad's going to happen. So there's to a greater or lesser degree, there's always a certain amount of anxiety about what's going to happen because part of it's out of the control. Part of that will naturally raise your blood pressure. They see it all the time. And so things that others can do to help lessen the chance of being an issue is Get some sleep the night before. Don't drink a bunch of coffee, especially espresso, right before you walk through the door. I see this happen again and again where people say, you know, their blood pressure's up. And I ask them, what happened? Did you drink any coffee? He said, yeah, I just had half a pot. And you go, oh, why are you doing that? My goal is to make things as easy as possible. They're simple things that any pilot 
can do to make it a lot easier for their fight physical. And one of those things is just avoid caffeine, avoid exercise, get some rest. It's simple as that. Super. Well, and th- this is so common that is there even a name for this? Don't they call this white coat effect that people who walk into a doctor's office, even if they're not a pilot, they may start to get elevated blood pressure? Yes. It's called a white coat syndrome, which is why I've never worn white coat it's in my career as an attending. And I even have my ex-wife's pink stethoscope that I use sometimes. Do what In order to make people get as comfortable and relaxed as possible, and at least a good AME is not out to ground you. You know, my idea is to keep, you know, just like the saying, keep them flying. My, I want to do everything that I can do to keep pilots in the air and get them back into the air. And so we're not, uh, we're not pilots enemies. I'm a pilot myself. I get nervous myself when I go to the doctor. I get nervous when I look in the mirror. You know, it, it's an understandably anxiety provoking exam, but there's some things that you can do to make it less problematic. What about times of day? Does blood pressure tend to be lower at certain times of day? Well, it's going to be lower usually at night when you fall asleep. I mean, there's a, there's a natural drop in that. During the day, I mean, I don't think it makes a big difference in terms of what's in their exams, unless there are people who jones for a pot of coffee. So in which case they should schedule the exam early in the morning so they can then have their coffee afterwards. So they're not freaking out about not having that caffeine boost in the morning. Mm-hmm. What are some of the different blood pressure limits for FAA physicals for different classes? So blood pressure limits do not vary by class. It's all the same. Blood pressure can't be above 155 over 95. It's actually pretty high, which is good because it allows it takes in or allows some freedom for if people are anxious and their blood pressure is naturally high up just because of anxiety. The American College of Cardiology and the American Heart Association recommendations for blood pressure are 120 over 80. You rarely see that. You know, that's just, that's the blood pressure of a teenage girl for the most part, you know. So you have a good limit of 155 or 95, but there's lots of things that people can do to help make sure they make it under that limit and make it a lot less stressful exam. And if people haven't gotten treatment for blood pressure, what would you recommend that they do perhaps prior to coming to their FAA physical? Well, is this someone who doesn't know if this is someone who doesn't know they have hypertension or they're recently diagnosed? It all depends. Go ahead. Let's talk about both of them. So if someone has known hypertension and they're on medication, their blood pressure is well controlled. Um, it's not a big deal with the FAA. Hypertension comes under a khaki condition. Khaki stands for conditions that AMEs can issue. So it's very easy to comply with the requirements for khaki for hypertension. They are, the blood pressure has to be 155 over 95. Most people are going to be lower than that. They have to be on the medication for at least seven days uh, without flying, without any signs of symptoms or any problems. It has to be one of, of many frontline medications for blood pressure and either their PCP or the AME uh, thinks that it's stable. Uh, and this is one of the few khakis where they don't need a note from the doctor, which makes it a lot easier. I, as the AME, can say, hey, I think this condition is stable. I fill out the worksheet, said yes, 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 yes. And I can just put khaki qualified hypertension. It's very easy. It's not something that people should work about. Pilots should not fear going on hypertension medications in terms of losing their medical. It's not a big deal uh, so long as it's well controlled. It's really, it's one of the easiest medical conditions to have and still fly. So it sounds like you should really be working with your own physician on issues like this before you go see your AME. Yeah. Yeah. You know, there's that saying that your primary care provider and your AME should never meet. You know, you shouldn't think of them as adversarial, but those kinds of chronic things are best dealt with by your primary care provider because their only allegiance is to their patient. Whereas an AME, I am a pilot, a pilot's advocate. I do whatever I can to keep them flying, but I also have to respond and follow the, the guidelines by the FAA. It's just the, the nature of being a, a, an AME. What are some of the other things that we as pilots should or shouldn't do before going into a physical? The big things are sleep the night before, get some rest. Um, I've seen some pilots come in and they've you know, just flown in from Argentina and they're tired and their blood pressure tends to be high. And then trying to, uh, especially a near vision test, especially older pilots, as we all have, unfortunately, going to a read classes, it just it makes it a lot more difficult. So get some sleep the night before, the morning thereof, avoid caffeine or any other stimulants. Uh, drink some water, drink a bottle or two of water because there is part of any flight phys- is a, a urine analysis just for protein and sugar. Drink water. It's a good thing. 
don't exercise. Exercise is great, but don't do it right before your exam because normal physiology, your blood pressure and heart rate go up. The FA doesn't recognize that you just exercise and biked 20 miles, and that's the reason why your blood pressure and heart rate up. So do all those things. You know, Really, if it tastes good, if it feels good or it's fun to do it, do it after the exam. Likewise, CFIs, don't pop over for exam in between given lessons because your blood pressure, you know, what CFIs blood pressure isn't elevated because they've been flying with brand new flight students. You know, it's, just, it's not the time to, to, to have a flight physical. Make it easy. The whole idea is to make it as easy as possible. So you walk in, there's no drama, and you walk out and go back on your life. And these days, we really need to go online and fill some things out first before we show up for the exam. Talk about that for folks who may not have done this before. So uh, 60 days, uh, within 60 days of seeing uh, AME or surgeon, you have to go to uh, the FAA, to do the Med Express and fill out a bunch of uh, information online. For new students, it's uh, it's uh, MedExpress without an E dot uh, FAA dot gov. And for new students, they have to, or new applicants, they have to fill out a bunch of demographics, name, date of birth, uh, address, hours, and so forth, then any health information. For people who are recurrent, they just have to, who are coming in for a, a week, for a renewal, they just have to update any information. Once they do that, that generates a 12-digit confirmation number. We need that confirmation number because we can't print out anything without that number ordered from the airman. And it would be helpful if they were to just print out their document and bring that with them along with the number, or doesn't that matter? For me, they don't have to do it. It's it's everything that they put in there, I pull up on the screen. It's a lot easier to read it on the screen. So all the, as far as I'm concerned, all they need is just a picture or a screenshot of that 12-digit number. That's all I need. It makes it a lot easier for, for them to find it, too, and they don't have to waste a bunch of paper. Let's talk about basic med a little bit. Uh, that was new about five years or so ago, so we're all getting a lot of more experience with it. Which kinds of pilots should be considering a basic med, and when in their flying career should they be considering it? So private pilots, particularly older, who have any medical problems are candidates for basic med. There are certain, there are, I think, 16 specific items that prohibit you from flying uh, under basic med unless you get a special issuance. If you have seizures, you're not going to be flying under basic med or under a regular regular first center class certificate. But if you have something like sleep apnea, unfortunately for the FAA, most of these people who are on sleep apnea have to go under a special issuance. And the reporting requirements can be somewhat burdensome. But those people under the discretion of the of the doctor performing the exam can fly under basic med without as much reporting as required otherwise. So if you're older, if you're 40s and 50s, you have some medical problems, basic med is a great thing if you're a pilot. You know, if you're flying a turbine aircraft, obviously basic med is not a uh, an option because you're flying above 18,000 feet. But for anyone in their 40s, 50s, 60s flying Cubs, 172s, 182s, RVs, even Cirrus, not the vision jets, but even if they're, you know, as long as they're staying below 18,000 feet, those are great. Those are great candidates for basic. I fly under basic med. I fly a Pawnee. That's, that's all I need. So I'm a flight instructor. Uh, tell me what should flight instructors either be telling their clients or not telling their clients about medicals? The one thing that I would caution flight CFIs about doing is not telling older pilots to get the highest class of medical, meaning a first class of medical, particularly if they're over 40. And I've seen this happen a couple of times where someone comes in, this wasn't with me, but they've come and seen another AME and their EKG is abnormal. And it's not necessarily a sign that there's something wrong with them, but then they end up being going under, getting a huge number of tests that really probably aren't necessary to prove that they're safe to fly. And it just let it, it ends up becoming a very time consuming, sometimes very expensive, and a very anxiety ridden process for for the student pilot. Particularly, this person is just starting out and flying. There's no reason why a new pilot at 40, a new student pilot at 40, needs to have a first class fall. Let them get a third class, or if they're even thinking of going commercial, get them a second class. But don't don't tell students to get the highest grade possible or highest level level certification possible because it's unnecessary. And it opens up a can of worms. Likewise, down the same path that pilots shouldn't use an FAA flight physical as their routine health screening. They shouldn't use it as a substitute for having a PCP. All right. Because again, as an AME, I take care of pilots. 
but I also have to report to the FAA. And there's some things that just be, it's better off that pilots see a primary care provider whose only loyalty and concern is the person in front of them and not a governmental organization. So we've covered a little bit of ground here. Any other kinds of things that you'd like to touch base on to kind of suggest pilots think about in terms of uh, their next medical? I, I was it just occurred to me this morning, you know, you can think of an AME as, you know, as, a, as an IA, as an IA for the pilots. You know, all we're doing is inspecting and authorizing saying you're fit to fly. That's all our goal is. We're not trying to ground you. We're not trying to, you know, I find myself, I'm, the last thing I want is an AME who's going to, and I don't think most AMEs are doing, are trying to ground people. They're just trying to say, hey, you're still fit to fly. We're not, uh, you know, we're on your side. Now, I've heard horror stories of some AMEs, and I know friends who've had trouble with, with AMEs who, for some reason, think it's their grudge to, I don't know, maybe we're going the route, down the route, but to ground people or to make things more difficult. But I think most AMEs want to keep people flying and do whatever they can within the law to keep them flying. That's great. Well, where can people find out more about you and the work you do giving flight exams? So my website is uh, aviatorsclinic.com and I have offices at uh, Naples Airport uh, in Naples, Florida, and then uh, a second office in Papado Beach over on the East Coast by Fort Lauderdale. Dylan, thanks so much for joining us here today. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. And my thanks to Dylan for talking with us today. You can find out more about him at aviatorsclinic.com, where you can also schedule a physical with him at either his Naples Airport or Papano Beach office. And if you have any question you'd like to ask him about FAA flight physicals, you can email him at ame at aviatorsclinic.com. And my apologies to those of you who downloaded a version of episode 244 that didn't include the doctor's half of the conversation. That was an error on my part. Many of the downloads went out fine, but unfortunately some of them did not. And thanks to everyone who contributes to the show in whatever way you do. I greatly appreciate your feedback, your emails, the reviews that you leave on the podcast app that you're currently listening to us in. And of course, your support financially through Patreon and PayPal. So until next time, fly safely, have fun and keep the blue side up.